Hi folks. All right, onward. Um, in this section of the lecture, we're gonna talk about um, uh, processes that occur in normal healthy bone. And I cannot emphasize that enough, healthy bone. Um, um, and then at the very end, we're gonna talk about a couple of problems that um, can occur. Obviously, um, we're not gonna cover all of the many things that can go wrong with uh, the skeletal system. We're just gonna talk about um, fractures um, very briefly and also about osteoporosis. Okay, so processes that occur in healthy bone. Um, first of all, bone formation, bone development, which is referred to as ossification, which just means um, the process of making uh, ossifying bone. Um, this occurs during fetal development um, and continues um, for a period after birth. Second, we have bone growth, right? And you need to be able to distinguish between these three processes, right? There's a difference between a bone growing, which um, refers to it lengthening and getting thicker um, compared to when the bone first forms during development. And then finally, um, you want to be able to distinguish both of those from bone remodeling, um, which is a process that occurs throughout our lives. All right. So to, to understand these, uh, how these processes happen, um, we need to talk a little bit more about the kinds of cells that you find in bone. Um, there are two separate, what we would call developmental lin lineages for, um, for these cells. So think of it as two different populations of stem cells that give rise to these two um, types of bones. So I'm gonna start with osteoclasts because they're so crazy looking, right? And this, the blue line here represents the two different lineages. And I, we're not gonna get into sort of where do the osteo, who are the ancestors of the osteoclasts? Um, Cause that's just too much detail for the amount of time we have in this course. So the osteoclasts are the sort of strangest looking of these cells, um, of the bone cells. They're responsible for resorbing or sometimes it's called absorbing bone, um, mineralized bone. So th these are the cells that break bone apart, the osteoclasts. Um, and one of the things that makes them look so strange in addition to the fact that they're ginormous compared to other osteocytes um, and the osteoblasts, is the presence of multiple nuclei in a single cell, All right? So this is one of the few places um, where we're gonna talk about cells that have more than one nucleus. Um, when we see that, it's in a healthy cell, it's because multiple precursor cells have fused together to form this sort of single um, giant cell, kind of like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Aren't they the ones that did that? I can't quite remember. Um, my kids were not little when that was happening. Um, all right. The other lineage is the other lineage, sorry, involves, um, or it begins with osteogenic cells. So remember, osteo, bone, gen means generate. These are pluripotent stem cells, um, and they can give rise, among a couple of other things, to the osteoblasts. The osteoblasts are the bone builders. Um, they are the cells that secrete the specialized collagen that becomes mineralized. And once 
an osteoblast has secreted a lot of uh, material that has attracted has attracted um, the mineral salts. It essentially has walled itself in and becomes an osteocyte. Right? So those are the mature bone cells that have the very long cytoplasmic processes that go through the canaliculi. All right, so here's some um, micrographs. So we've got mature osteocytes here all the way on the right that are sending processes out through um, the canaliculi in order to communicate with other bone cells. Um, you have in the middle an osteocyte in a lacuna um, and right above it, you have this extraordinarily large osteoclast, All right? So you can, you can sort of make out the multiple nuclei that are here, right? And you can see that sort of dome shape and can almost make out the sort of frilly surface here. When you see osteocytes through the microscope, you are usually going to see them associated with this sort of pit in the mineralized bone. Um, and that's because they've been actively secreting enzymes and um, other molecules that are capable of breaking apart the mineralized bone. Right? That's really important. Um, and again, this is a function that happens in normal bone and is part of the way that we um, regulate blood calcium. Finally, we have on the left um, osteoblasts. They tend to occur in groups um, along the surface of bone um, that is being mineralized or built. Right, and the osteocyte that is in the middle here was once an osteoblast, but it has essentially walled itself in by secreting um, collagen that's becoming mineralized. This is a section through spongy bone, and one of the reasons why I want to show you guys this one, um, so when you look at, at this, this tissue through the microscope, you'll be able to recognize the difference between the bony areas and the red bone marrow. So the area, let's see, I'm gonna outline this in different color. It's red, I guess I will use red. Um, All of this area, as well as this, and this, and this, um, those are all cells associated with the formed elements of the blood, right? You can even, uh, you can almost make out some of the, um, this one in particular, um, the red blood cells as they're maturing, right? You can see our friends, the osteocytes, the mature bone cells sitting in their lacunae. Right. Um, we have oops, we have an example of an osteoclast over here. Looks like there's one here as well. Um, and then we have the oops, we have um, we have the osteoblasts, right? There's osteoblasts. These are all osteoblasts. Um, when you see the term bone matrix, right, just think that's mineralized bone, right? If we were looking at um, a um, cortical or compact bone, we would be looking at the lamellae 
of osteons. Okay, so now that you have a sense about the, what those bone or what those um, different types of bone cells are, let's talk about bone formation or bone development. Right? It's referred to as ossification. Um, and it occurs during embryonic development. Um, long bones form from a hyaline cartilage model um, that is replaced by bone. The osteoblast, um, the, the chondrocytes that, um, that form the hyaline cartilage um, as bone starts to form around the outside of the cartilage model, those cells are no longer able to access nutrients, right? Because remember with cartilage, no blood vessels, they depend on diffusion. Um, and when you start to have mineralized bone, diffusion is not going to be very effective. Um, so those chondrocytes begin to die and the osteoblasts fill in the spaces. So the type of um, bone development um, we're going to talk about, and this is the process used to form long bones, is referred to as endochondrial ossification. It's kind of a mouthful, but again, we want to break down the words. So ossification, oops, ossification means the process of making bone Chondro means um, cartilage, and endo means inner. So this is telling us we are building bone by having an inner cartilage model. So we start with the hyaline cartilage model, right? Um, and we've got, in the second image, we've got the chondrocytes sitting in their lacunae, um, the first thing that happens is that um, osteoblasts start secreting a material called osteoid. And the osteoid um, is essentially the collagen matrix that attracts minerals. So that creates a collar around the outside of a shaft of the spongy bone. So a collar around the di what will become the diaphysis, right? And there's no real bone formation going on in the epiphyses at that, this point. The next thing that happens is that blood vessels begin to penetrate the mineralized bone. Um, and that's where we see the primary ossification center, which just means it's the first place that you really have bone formation, right? Um, and again, that starts when you have blood vessels penetrating what will become the medullary cavity, right? Eventually the chondrocytes and the inside of, of the diaphysis are going to die and give rise to the, our friend, the medullary cavity. Um, following primary ossification, we have the development of secondary ossification centers, right? So as, um, and that's occurring in the epiphyses, both proximal and distal. Um, and eventually you end up with um, hyaline cartilage left only in the areas where the bones are going to be contacting one another, right? Um, so hyaline cartilage is articular, or articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Um, we have it on both ends, right? And then we have um, an area that's referred to as the epiphyseal growth plate. Um, where you still have chondrocytes growing, right? Um, 
the epiphyseal growth plate is what allows for bone lengthening, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. So for those of you that like things written out, you can read through this slide at your leisure. Um, the image on the bottom is just to show you over the course of, um, of embryonic development. So 28 weeks, 39 weeks um, of fetal development. Um, this is what bone looks like. And then early in the first year, a year and um, a couple of months, and then finally two and a half years is what the, um, as the bone really becomes more mature. All right, so endochondrial ossification is bone formation. Now, obviously, we get taller after we're born. Um, which is a function of bone growth or bone. We're gonna, we're gonna focus on bone lengthening as opposed to the thickening of bone. Um, so, and as I said before, that involves the epiphyseal growth plate. As long as the, epi as the chondrocytes in the epiphyseal growth plate are active and are reproducing, as they reproduce, they push the diaphysis toward the middle of the bone, right? Which results in the bone lengthening. Um, all the way to the right um, is actually um, a micrograph of the um, top of the epiphysis, what's referred to as the resting zone of chondrocytes, the proliferating zone where they're reproducing like crazy, the degenerating zone where they start to die. And as they die, the osteoblasts um, do their thing in the ossification zone. Um, just sidebar, I'm always amazed by how incredibly beautiful that tissue is. It looks like, it looks like sort of modern art painting. It's one of the reasons histology is such a lovely thing to study. Okay, so we'll talk more about hormones when we talk about the endocrine system, but um, hormones affect bone growth. So first and foremost um, is growth hormone. Growth hormone stimulates um, general overall bone growth and it stimulates specifically cells in the epiphyseal plates. Also stimulates muscle growth, growth hormone does. Um, the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone and their derivatives increase uh, growth during adolescence, which is what's responsible for the adolescent growth spurt. Um, in females, it's uh, it sort of interesting um, early in puberty, the exposure to increasing levels of estrogen results in a growth spurt. But then once menstruation begins um, and estrogen levels are um, consistently high, at least across and then across the menstrual cycle, um, that actually leads to the sealing of the epiphyseal um, growth plate and in a mature bone you end up with uh, let's see da, da, da. you just end up with what's referred to as an, the epiphyseal line um, it's no longer metabolically active and the bone can't grow um, vitamin D is a steroid hormone um, that is converted um, in the liver to, I believe it's the liver, I have to look that up, um, into its active form. And that acts in the small intestine to allow the absorption of calcium. 
All right, and then our final um, process that occurs in normal healthy bones is referred to as bone remodeling. Um, as adults, our skeletons are constantly being broken down, which is referred to as resorption or absorption, um, and new bone is laid down. And I'm gonna cross out formation here because I think that's a confusing word. And put in deposition, bone is deposited, right? This process is absolutely critical for maintaining calcium ion homeostasis, right? When we talked about the nervous system, I said, you know, our bones are the least of the body's worries when it comes to calcium. Um, bone will be broken down in order to um, ensure that there is an adequate supply of calcium ions in the blood. And that's because um, you need calcium for the function of the nervous system, as you'll see next week, the function of the muscular system, and for blood clotting. All of those are more important when it comes to getting away from the bear, as we say in Ohio, the bear. Okay, so remember, osteoclasts, they break bone down. They create these little pits. The osteoblasts come into the pits and secrete osteoid and build up new bone. Um, in adults, bone resorption and deposition are coupled, right? So they're in a, a homeostatic balance controlled by um, parathyroid hormone in calcitonin um, so that and that's what allows us to maintain blood calcium levels so on the left you have the osteoclasts doing their thing and breaking down bone on um, the cartoon here you have osteoblasts secreting osteoid, which again is um, the collagen substance, um, collagen and water substance that is gonna become mineralized. Um, and on the right, you just see this in the, in the actual, um, in a slice of tissue. So the mineralized bone is shown in the sort of turquoise and we've got osteoid here Right, and you can see this line, this huge line of osteoblasts doing their thing. And over here, we've got the osteoclasts. Right, so these things are happening at the same time, um, and it's a perfectly normal process. Um, 10 to 18 percent of your bone turns over every year. Right, which means even if you have a low level of turnover, every 10 years your skeleton is completely different. Um, and that's in adults, right? We're not talking about growth or bone formation. This is important for two reasons. One, our bones respond to physical stress. Right? It's one of the reasons why weight-bearing exercise is so important. It makes uh, increases the density of your bones. Um, being able to respond to stress allows bone to be strengthened in areas where tendons are constantly pulling on it, right? So if someone's a blacksmith, for example, um, and they're right-handed, the muscles um, in their right arm and the scapula or shoulder blade are going to be um, really, really dense because the muscles are constantly pulling on them as the blacksmith swings um, his or her hammer. Blood calcium is regulated, as I mentioned earlier, through parathyroid hormone, um, which acts on osteoclasts 
it's responsible for increasing blood calcium when blood calcium gets too low, right? Calcitonin decreases blood calcium when it's high, and it does that by stimulating deposition of bone. So you can associate that with osteoblasts. All right, so problems that can go, things that can go wrong. Well, one of these problems is osteoporosis, which literally means, right, osteo is bone, porous. Um, poor for porous, osis means condition, a condition of porous or weakened bones. And this is easiest to see in um, spongy bone. So. This can occur for, um, for the cause of, there can be a lot of different causes of this, right? A, a tumor in um, the parathyroid gland, which leads to increased parathyroid hormone, which stimulates osteoblast act, or osteoclast activity, um, can lead to abnormal bone breakdown. There's also a normal process um, normal quote-unquote um, process that occurs with aging um, where the bones become thinner. And thin, thinner bones, meaning bones that are less dense, right? If you compare the top image to the bottom image here, you can see it would be a lot easier um, for the trabeculae to break here than it is up at the top. Um, the age-related decline that we see in bone density is more pronounced in females because females have a more rapid drop in estrogen, and estrogen is um, one of the factors in adults that can increase bone density. The drop-off in estrogen levels for males is not as great. Right. Um, the most problematic areas for osteoporosis are um, the vertebra of the spine because um, when those break, um, it pushes on discs, um, which and the discs are there to allow space between the vertebra for the spinal nerves. So it can lead to a lot of pain. Um, we often see in elderly folks. Um, fractures of the hip. Um, and often, you know, people will say, well, my grandma fell down and broke her hip. But often um, we have the causality wrong there. It's the, actually the opposite. Um, the hip, um, the head of the femur, um, or part of the coxal bone, which is the pelvis, the bones that make up the pelvis, um, is osteoporotic, the bone breaks and the person falls because of the sudden shift in weight. So this is just showing it occurs, this graph shows it occurs in both males and females, right? One of the reasons why um, weight-bearing activity is so important for young folks is that as you are increasing bone density, the more weight-bearing activity you have, the higher the, this peak can be. So let's say you have um, someone who is participating in some sort of sports activity, a, a woman, right? You can end up with a much higher um, bone density. And the higher you start, the better off you are. Fractures. Um, fractures, there are lots of different types and the treatment is gonna depend on the type. Fractures heal in a four-step process um, and they will heal if, um, regardless of whether or not um, they're set with essentially a bruise, which is a hematoma, followed by the formation of a fibrocartilage callus, which takes about three weeks then that cartilage is replaced by bone, 
And then finally, and this process sometimes takes years, the bone is remodeled, right? A serious break is often going to leave a little bit of a lump um, 